Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining the latest Myerson Solicitor Commercial Litigation Webinar, which is one of a series of webinars we presented on the effects of COVID-19 on a whole range of legal issues. My name is Tim Norman. I'm a partner in the dispute resolution team here at Myerson. If I could start today by doing a little bit of housekeeping, the webinar will be recorded and circulated to those of you who have attended today, as well as posted on our YouTube channel. You will have noticed when you join the meeting, your microphones are automatically placed on mute. I will ask if you can keep them on mute for the duration of the webinar. There will be an opportunity to ask questions at the end. And again, I'll ask if you keep your microphones on mute, ask the questions through the chat function you will find shown on the bar of your screens. We have had some questions already posted in advance of the webinar. The presentation will last around 15 minutes. The webinar is aimed at businesses who have business interruption cover in an insurance policy or think they should have. I may refer to business interruption as BI. It is a dry subject. It's not very exciting, but at the moment, it may be the difference between a business surviving or not. I'm going to cover the following topics. Insurance policies as legal contracts, two types of BI policy cover, quantifying your claim and the legal requirement of causation, options if your claim is rejected through the FCA and the Financial Ombudsman Service, and a little bit about the broker's involvement. So looking at policies of insurance, policies of insurance are legal contractual documents. They are a contract between the insured, that's you, and the insurer. Commercial insurance policies, as you will have realised if you've read them, are lengthy, wordy and complicated documents. There will typically be a policy and schedule of cover, which make up the legal matrix between the parties. You will not be surprised to hear me say that if you have an issue or dispute with the meaning of the business interruption sections of a commercial insurance policy, you should get a lawyer to advise you. In my view, there is no one size fits all way of dealing with business interruption claims. You may have read about group or class actions being considered against a number of specific insurers. Iscox and the Beaver are two you may have read about. Group litigation has its place, but in my view, each individual claim of business has its own particular set of circumstances relating to its business. How you operate your business and how the current circumstances lead to an interruption in that business are unique to you. The losses that you suffer will also be specific to your business. In my view, there is no substitute for having somebody look at your specific business, how it's been affected, the losses you are suffering, and the specific clauses in your insurance policy. Advice can then be given tailored to your unique circumstances. So let's look at the common types of business interruption clauses and whether you are covered. In response to the closure of business, business interruption policies or clauses within policies will no doubt have been looked at. The owners of businesses will no doubt feel strongly that having purchased business interruption, their losses ought to be covered. It is logical to think that if your business has been interrupted by something completely out of your control and you've paid for business interruption cover, your losses should be covered. However, it's not as simple as that. Business interruption sections of commercial insurance policies tend to fall into two groups. The first of those groups is business interruption caused by damage to property. If it is included, business interruption cover is often included within a property damage policy or a section of the policy dealing with property damage. It's tied to property damage wording by way of a material damage proviso. The material damage proviso requires that the business interruption losses flow from an incident of property damage. In most cases, COVID-19 will be a disease affecting human life and will not cause property damage. There is currently no case precedent to support an argument that contamination by pathogens can amount to material damage. The concept has been explored in other jurisdictions, but not yet in England and Wales. The material damage proviso may be satisfied 
where the business has required a deep clean to its premises for reasons connected to the outbreak of the disease. But periods of closure for deep clean purposes are likely to be relatively short and therefore loss of business caused by closure for cleaning might be relatively small. However, losses that are caused by interruption to business are likely to be relatively significant. The period that this COVID-19 has been with us is now a long period. So therefore it might be worth trying to expand the meaning of the scope of the cover with arguments as to the meaning of damage to property. It might conceivably be argued that a property which is shown to have contained or had the virus present on the property itself has suffered damage. There is case authority that damage can be sustained without the need for permanent change to the damaged property. So do not just assume that property damage means some physical, obvious and permanent damage. I will be mentioning the court's approach to interpretation of contracts later. It is how the court will interpret words in a contract, in this case the policy, which will determine the outcome of a legal claim. So moving on to business interruption caused by non-property damage. This second type of policy is where you have cover for business interruption caused by a series of specified trigger events. If one of those events is satisfied, cover will attach to losses caused by that event, subject always to the other terms of the policy relating to, for example, exclusions and financial limits. This type of cover typically falls into one of three categories. Denial or prevention of access to your premises, an act of civil or statutory authority, and disease. Time only permits me to concentrate on the type of policy which covers losses caused by disease. In this type of policy, the trigger may be a specified list of diseases which triggers coverage, or the occurrence of a notifiable disease without the policy containing a specified list. So dealing with the specified list of diseases. If your policy covers you only for business interruption caused by a specified list of diseases named in the policy, you may well have problems. COVID-19 will not be among the list of specified diseases. In policies issued before about January 2020, it was not known. More recently, and once it has become known, insurers will not list it as a specified disease because they know that claims will likely result. However, if SARS is one of the list of diseases in the policy, there may be arguments that because the virus's scientific name is SARS-CoV-2, it is sufficiently similar to SARS. If SARS is a listed disease under a policy, the argument would go that COVID-19 is included as a listed disease and is included under the heading SARS, and therefore the event which gives rise to the cover has been triggered. Moving on to notifiable diseases. COVID-19 is a notifiable disease. You are likely to have better claims if your policy wording is not so specific as to be limited to specific diseases. If it covers loss triggered just by the occurrence of a notifiable disease without the policy containing a specified list, then you may have a good claim. So having established whether the wording in your policy covers the type of event which might trigger a claim, I want to look at the next legal argument which is likely to feature in these type of claims, and that is the issue of causation. So you've considered the specific wording of the policy, you believe that the wording in your case is wide enough to cover business interruption. The next task is to calculate and detail the losses you have suffered as a consequence of the interruption to the business. However, the two factors, namely the policy wording and the financial calculation of losses suffered, have to be linked. The law in this area refers to this link as causation. Fortunately, the courts have avoided laying down any formal test for causation. They have relied on common sense to guide decisions as to whether the event is a sufficient substantial cause of the loss. The court has to decide if the event was the cause of the loss or merely the occasion for the loss. So we are expecting insurers to raise arguments that if your loss follows a closure of business premises, 
or other interruption to the business cycle. They are not as a direct result of and caused by the virus, but as a consequence of the intervention by the government in response to the virus. Insurers may well argue that it is the government's action which have caused the loss and not the virus itself. You will be assisted in these cases if your policy also includes losses covered by the actions of a competent authority, because it is the actions of the authority, the government or local authority, which have closed the premises. Another aspect of causation is whether the losses or reduced business would have been suffered in any event. Where a business is forced to close because of the virus, insurers may argue that even though you closed your business as a result of the virus, you would not have made the profits you normally make because the demand for your services which was much reduced in any event. The test sometimes applied in these situations is a but for test. The test is, would you have made the profit but for the event that triggers the policy? Insurers will argue that you would not have made the profit or taken the revenue anyway, even if your premises could have remained open because the market was no longer there for your services. As I stated at the beginning of this webinar, an insurance policy is a legal contract between the insured and the insurer. And therefore, common rules of construction, which the courts use when interpreting contracts will apply. And some of these rules of construction will help. The courts will consider not only the specific text of the clause and give it appropriate weight, but they will also consider the remainder of the contract in which the provision occurs. They will consider the context and background to the contract. They will give appropriate weight to business common sense or the commercial purpose of the contract. And they will avoid giving a literal effect to the words of the contract where that would lead to very unreasonable results. In the context of insurance contracts, courts can look to the purpose behind the policy, which may provide some help. The courts may be asking themselves, if an insurance policy is not going to provide cover, what is the point of the contract? The parties making the contract at the time must have intended cover to extend to loss of business revenue. It is in the policy. So whilst the policy and cover schedules were given the circumstances in which a claim can be made, in cases where interpretation of those words are ambiguous and can be stretched to include your specific circumstances, the courts may be sympathetic to these arguments and find a way through the rules of construction to interpret them in your favor. So what if your claim is rejected in correspondence? What options are available to you? I could just mention the Financial Conduct Authority. The FCA have said that they intend to apply to court for court declarations aimed at resolving contractual uncertainty. They are trying to resolve that uncertainty which has arisen in selected business interruption policies. The FCA statements recognise that claims may already be the subject of negotiation and their proposed action is not intended to disrupt the normal claim process. Individual businesses are still perfectly entitled to pursue their own issues through negotiated settlement, arbitration and court proceedings. They can also take their eligible complaints to the Financial Ombudsman Service. The current position, as at the 15th of May, is that the FCA is inviting information from insured businesses and set a deadline of the 20th of May, yesterday, to receive that information. They will then have to put together their legal case and issue the proceedings in the High Court for the declarations that they seek. The action being taken by the FCA may assist as the court becomes engaged. The statements of case in the FCA proposed action will be made available to the public. I'm sure the court will want the action to progress as quickly as possible, but it is not advisable in my view to sit back and wait for the FCA court action to progress and eventually be heard by a judge. We don't know if the declarations it will seek will cover the wording in your policy. We don't know when the action will start. We can expect lengthy responses from the insurance industry. It will be interesting and helpful, but in my view, if you have a claim, you need to get on with it. If your claim is rejected by your insurance company, you have the options of pursuing legal action, 
or making a complaint to the financial ombudsman service. To make a complaint, you have to be a small business with annual turnover of less than 6.5 million pounds and fewer than 50 employees or an annual balance sheet below 5 million pounds. Before you can make a complaint, you have to exhaust your insurer's or broker's complaints procedure. It is only when they have issued their final response letter that you can contact the FOS. The FOS can award compensation up to a cap of £355,000, which is helpful. You can expect the Financial Ombudsman Service, however, to be receiving many complaints over the coming months. The advantage of using the FOS is that it is free. You are unlikely to have any regular contract, any regular contact or control over how your complaint is proceeding. The FOS has its own way of dealing with complaints against financial institutions, such as insurance companies, and they will go through those processes and make a finding. Insurers will not be concerned about threats of legal action because they are large enough to absorb such threats. However, if there are good arguments for cover, legal action may be a quicker route to resolving the problem and does allow for applications to be made for interim payments. Insurers generally sit up and take notice when proceedings are issued. I'd now like to move on to the question of the position of the insurance broker. Most policies of commercial insurance are arranged through a broker. Most brokers, like most solicitors, are very good. But as with any professional, you put your faith and trust in the professional doing their job and they receive remuneration for it. In most cases, a contract is made either expressly or by implication between the insurance broker and his client. Typically, the broker may handle all of the client's insurance affairs. There is implied by law a term that the broker will exercise reasonable skill and care. The broker may have other specific duties, for example, relating to a particular form of insurance. In general, the broker's role may be broken down into the following steps. Identify the type and scope of cover which the client needs and advise accordingly. Take reasonable steps to arrange the insurance cover which the client has instructed him to obtain. If the broker is unable to arrange the requested cover, he should advise the client as to the scope of cover that has and has not been arranged. Once the cover has been placed, the broker should consider and explain to the client what cover has been arranged. At the renewal of an existing policy, the broker should go through the same exercise that was carried out at the inception of the policy. Each one of those topics is too large for a webinar of this type. So I would like to say just a few words about one of them, namely the broker's obligation to adequately assess the client's needs. If the client asks the broker to arrange a specific type of insurance, that is the limit of the broker's responsibility. If, however, the client gives no such specific instructions, but relies upon his agent to see that he is protected, and if the agent agrees to do business on those terms, the agent broker may have some liability afterwards when a loss arises. There is some statutory assistance here under the Insurance Conduct of Business Sourcebook, which is known as ICOBS. ICOBS applies to firms which carry out insurance business, which is not a life insurance business. Rule 5.3.2 of ICOBS imposes an obligation on a broker to establish the customer's demands and needs using information readily available and either, either accessible to the broker or by obtaining further relevant information from the customer. And a further rule of ICOBS provides that prior to the conclusion of a contract, a firm must specify, in particular on the basis of information provided by the customer, the demands and needs of that customer as well as the underlying reasons for any advice given to the customer on that policy. So in the specific case of business interruption cover, where there is any complexity in determining the appropriate sum insured, which may apply to business interruption insurance, the broker needs to advise the client how the sum insured should be calculated. The broker should also draw attention to the consequence of underinsurance, particularly where the policy is subject to average. The duration of cover will also need to be considered. If I can just summarise and close and then lead on to questions. Um, I hope you found the webinar useful. The matters which need to be considered are 
the wording of the policy in relation to PI cover. Does the cover obviously meet the circumstances? Or, more likely, are there arguments that your circumstances fall within the scope of cover? Options available are legal action or a complaint to the Financial Ombudsman Service. Keep an eye out for the application being made by the Financial Conduct Authority to the court for declarations. And finally, if BI cover is not in place or is inadequate, have you relied upon your broker? So that just leaves the questions and answers session. You will see on, you will see on the slides Myerson's dedicated website link, which has useful coronavirus updates. It is updated as the government come out with further information, and I would recommend you have a look at it. We have other social media platforms, so please feel free to subscribe and follow Myerson solicitors as we will continue to push out regular updates. And of course, if you need to get in touch with us by any means, reach out to us. You have our contact details on screen. So if I can now move on to the questions and answers. Just take me a few moments to get these uh, questions that we've already had submitted, and I will try to deal with them. Okay, so first question is, um, how long would a legal claim against an insurance company take? And what might the legal costs be? Well, litigation uh, is not particularly quick and is not inexpensive. Um, the sooner you start your process, the sooner you're going to put your insurance company on notice of your intention to bring legal proceedings and the more likely you will be to get a result. But if you have to start proceedings and the insurance company defend it, you're unlikely to get a trial for a period of about a year. It could be less, it's not likely to be much less. However, there are interim applications which can be made during the course of legal processes, either for an interim declaration or an interim payment or in strong cases for summary judgment. The costs of legal action are not inexpensive. Um, there are various ways of funding these uh, legal actions, which Myerson and other solicitors do offer, um, but litigation is uh, an expensive route. However, if you've got a successful claim, your insurance company will want to settle it, and you can expect to recover costs from the defendant insurer if they have put you to the cost of instructing solicitors. So the next question is, is there anything I should be doing whilst my business is effectively closed and I'm losing money? In all contract claims, which is what this would be, there is an obligation on the claimant, that's you, to mitigate your loss. So if during a period of business interruption, you're suffering a loss of revenue, you are expected to take all steps that are reasonably necessary to reduce your loss, to reduce the amount of the claim. That could be reducing expenses so that you uh, minimise the expenses that you have to pay, or it could be finding other sources of revenue which you can undertake. Next question is, I believe I have a good claim, but I'm not sure that my business will survive waiting for a payment from my insurance company. It is to be hoped that insurers will not let debt claims drag out for so long that businesses do not survive. The FCA have put out statements expecting insurers to deal with claims efficiently and properly and quickly. And the only route available to the court action would be an application for an interim payment. Uh, in those cases, the court may be uh, satisfied that your claim is strong enough and likely to succeed. If it got to that stage, I would expect insurers, however, to be considering settlement. And finally, it's a question here that says, what can we claim for? My cover, which is not much, did cover notifiable diseases, but my broker immediately said, oh, that is only those that were notifiable at the time of inception. That was just over a month before lockdown began. So I think what's being asked here is a situation where the policy of insurance is taken out, say, a few months ago or six months ago or something like that. And that's the start of the policy year, if, if the cover is for a year. 
and the policy has a clause which says that you'll be covered for business interruption caused by a notifiable disease. The broker seems to have said that, the note, if I understand it correctly, that the notifiable disease must have been a disease notified at the time of the policy inception, so when, when the contract was made. Um, it will depend upon the precise wording of the policy, but I'm not sure that would be right. Um, in my view, um, insurance of this type is insurance for a period coming into the future, so a year, to cover you against incidents that happen during that year. If the policy says that you will be covered in the event of an incident of a notifiable disease, I think that means a disease which occurs, which outbreaks and becomes notifiable. I think the notifiable bit relates to the seriousness of the disease and it allows for some sort of um, specification to be made. So not all diseases will be covered, but if the disease is notifiable, it is covered. I also think that um, if the broker was right, the policy would say notified diseases. Um, it, it would be a policy that says that you're covered in the event there is an outbreak of a disease already notified. Um, in that case, it would probably have to refer to a list of those notified diseases or a place where those notified diseases could be obtained. Um, so I'm not sure that the broker in that case would be right, but I would need to see uh, the obviously precise wording of the, of the policy. So that's the end of the questions. I hope um, they have been helpful to you. I hope the webinar has been helpful. Um, finally, as a reminder, the webinar is recorded and will be circulated to you later today. Thank you and goodbye.